here at Office Hours with Jonah Sachs. Jonah is a world-renowned marketeer. He's an entrepreneur. He's, uh, he does a lot of work with stories. His focus is on social good. He's a, he's a social change strategist. You kind of do it all. And I want to thank you for being on and welcome to Office Hours. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Now, I, I read your, uh, your, your, your first book, I think, or your previous book about the story wars. And I thought it was very timely and, and really important. Tell us a little bit about why stories are so important, particularly to organizations that have, uh, let's say, professional services, things that are a little harder to explain to people, why they have to get their story straight, and maybe give us a few tips on how to do that. Sure. I mean, in an age of information overload, which obviously we're all, we're all living in, people don't want more facts and figures, especially at a time where there's so much question about experts and do experts actually know what they're talking about. So when you get up there and you just start reciting what you believe um, and more info that you think people need, it, it just washes. It gets, it gets ignored. Um, but stories have always been the way that humans make sense of the world and, and get meaning. So, you know, at a time with too much information and too little meaning, People really are resonating more with stories. Um, they, they get the idea across. In some ways, it's, it's, it's ironic because it takes a little longer to tell a story in a way than just to recite a fact. But the, the download into someone's belief system is a lot faster through a story. So one of the things I evangelize is, is you know, look, we're past that time where you make that 30-second ad or publish that white paper and you get to broadcast your ideas. We're at a time of conversation now. And if you can make your brand itself a story, or your organization itself, itself a story that you are telling, that's being told by everyone around you, that every tweet and Facebook post and video you put out is another chapter in that larger narrative, you're really kind of going to make that resonance that makes people say, hey, that's my story too. I want to be part of this tribe. I want to support what you're doing. I want to get on board. And so stories have always sort of played that, that function. And you, know, you asked for a couple of tips. One of the things I, I say is, you know, if your brand is a story, who's the hero of that story? In the old days, it was possible for you, the marketer, to be the, the hero, the brand to be the hero. Now people just, you know, don't want that anymore. They don't, don't want to know how great you are. They want to know how great they can be through a relationship with you. So really making your audience the hero of that story that you're telling is a, is a, is a huge flip. And it's not sort of, uh, you suck unless you get our product or get on board with us. It's um, you know you have a great po- you have a great possibility. Let us show you how to get there. Let, is let, that, is let, that me push, let me push back on this because this is a big issue for an old guy like me, an old boomer, you know, who grew up reading and writing a lot. And on the I'm still constantly on the speaking circuit. One of the things yeah. I find with younger people, because of the world of terse social media, is yeah. their ability to 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 weave a yarn, if you will, to really tell something that's kind of got a number of moving pieces, really fascinating kind of a thing. Um, my opinion is, and I'm sure if you talk to other people my age, kind of lacking. You know, tell me a little bit about how social media or the media changes the story, and give some tips to our young viewers out there, particularly maybe even some old viewers, about how in social media, in a couple of minutes, and that nice short compressed thing, we can really enhance our ability to connect, as you said, to engage in a meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really easy to sort of go and chase after this, if I say something funny, if I say something witty, if I just jump into that conversation with a meme, I'm going to get all this attention. And a lot of studies show that just getting attention actually does not necessarily build brand value, right? You can create buzz, but is that really building understanding? Is that really driving action for your brand? So, um, you know, I just always want to step back and say, Okay, what is that core insight that we stand for? What is that core piece of information? We're not talking about moving away from truth or information. We're just talking about finding something that when people hear, they don't say, "Uh that's funny. They say, yeah, that's my truth too. So taking that core of something that's truly resonant, you know, and and that may be fact-based. It should be fact-based. And then finding ways to wrap that in that unexpected way and to do it instead of in the abstraction of facts and figures, but in the lives of real people or in characters that look different than we expect that interrupt our attention and say, huh, I'm curious, I'm interested, but still pointing to larger truths. And too many brands really do chase at the uh, expense of their own red equity. 
just, you know, attention on social media. And that's really not what, what we're looking for. Yep. I think what we're looking yep. for, in my mind, is find those people who are, you know, your potential evangelists. Give them a thing that they can share with that next circle. You don't need to hit everybody. You yep. need to sort of arm the choir, as I call it. You know, you don't have to, you don't want to preach to the choir only, but arm them with something that they say, yeah, I want to pass that along. And you start to build that sort of story equity. Yeah, I know. I really like one of the things you pointed out. It's one of, it's also one of my hot buttons right now is facts. You know, I, I love to tell, I love to tell stories like where, you know, I was an advisor to the Federal Reserve Bank. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll listen to somebody on a television program talk about why we shouldn't have the Federal Reserve. And they're full of opinions, but they're facts. They have no facts. They don't understand how anything works. And I see this all the time, right? It's all spin. It's all facts. But there's a relationship between facts and personal truth. And I think you're laying that out, that facts aren't personal truth, but somehow you have to relate the two. But you got to have both of them. So I see a lot of social media stuff that talks about personal truth, but it's just factually incorrect or factually correct stuff that doesn't relate to people. And I think what you're espousing is very important, which is to connect the two things. Now, let me let me fish down there. Let me explore a little more there. Um, one of the things that I have to deal with on a regular basis are strategies that are that thick, you know, complex, just ridiculous. And there's a reason. I'm, I'm one of the things that really frustrates me is that everybody wants everything to be simple. And of course, modernity is complex. You know, my saying, which is probably unpopular is simplicity is for simpletons, right? The world's complicated. You have to have, you have to have a way of, of framing the world and making sense out of things. So, so tell me about how you get a company that loves that kind of complexity to sort of weave it, because I know you're a master at this, to weave it into something simple. How do you get this great big fat document, thousands of moving pieces? How do, what's what's the journey, if you will? You know, like Joseph uh, Campbell used to talk about it. Tell us about that journey and how to do that. Sure. So, um, you know, in the old days of storytelling, the old, old days of storytelling, uh, you know, you'd, you'd hear a, a, a fable, for instance, and at the end the storyteller would say, and the moral of the story is, you know, nice guys finish last. So the moral of the story is he who hesitates is lost, something like that. And it wraps up this whole story, right? And if you, you know, study literature and you, you know, take, take a, a beginning, beginning course in literature, your teacher's going to ask you to wrap up, you know, what was the author trying to tell you in East of Eden, in this, you know, 500 page book? And so there's complexity. There's many characters, there's many chapters. But in the end, you do come down to some core human truth. And that's what Campbell really talked about quite a bit. These truths that when we hear them, they're more like we're remembering them. They were learning something new. And so what is that core human truth? And now that core human truth doesn't express all the complexity of your great strategy. But I do ask people, say, okay, you gave me this, you know, super thick story. What's the moral? You know, let's let's figure this out. And if you practice doing that with other complicated, you know, look at other brands, look at other companies um, that have done this well, and you say, okay, well, you know, Nike, for instance, everyone admires the Nike brand, right? And if you boil down what they've been saying, what made them so successful, other brands were always saying, uh, we can we can make achievement, we can, we can achieve for you. Wear these shoes, you'll be a great basketball player. Nike has always said, actually, achievement's really hard, but everything you need is already inside of you. We're going to help you bring it out. And so they've been able to like, run that basic moral of the story into you know, all kinds of strategies over the course of their, you know, last 30 years. So I really, really challenge, and, you know, clients really resist, um, you know, figuring out, boil that down. What's the moral of the story we're telling? And then that should be a doorway through which everything makes coherent, brings coherence to everything we yeah, do. And it's very effective when it works. It reminds me of that old Pascal, the philosopher quote, I'm sorry I wrote you a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one, right? Yeah, right. and I really like finding the core of that and how hard it is to find the core of a story. I also like the fact that part of reading and thinking deeply prepares you for that. That's what that's what yeah. literature prepares you for, right? Now, I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't ask you because I, uh, I just saw you've got a new book coming out, and I love the title, Unsafe Thinking. Tell us what is unsafe thinking and why we should be practicing unsafe thinking. Sure. I mean, uh, the, you know, in, in the shortest terms, it's the opposite of safe thinking, right? Like safe thinking is all about how we take the least amount of risk. We stay in those patterns and ruts that have worked for us in the past. Um, we you know, rely on 
conventional wisdom that nobody could argue with. We don't step on anyone's toes. You know, we, we take that, uh, this thing called the hill, hill climbing heuristic, which is that, you know, when you want to get to somewhere, the best thing to do is take the next obvious step towards the top of that mountain, right? But often mountains can't be climbed straight by going straight up to the top. You have to take unusual paths. So safe thinking is really just how do we take that next obvious step forward? Unsafe thinking is really about how do we challenge our core dominant logic, our way of seeing the world, uh, who we are willing to work with, um, how we how we use our intuition or challenge our own intuition, how we um, break that conventional wisdom that seems like it's really coming from within, but it's really just what we've heard, how we take intelligent risks. And, you know, the human mind, of course, is very good at spotting patterns and sticking with those patterns. Um, unfortunately, in a world that changes really quickly, patterns are not valuable for more than, uh, you know, a couple months, a couple of years. So if you've been doing something really well for a long time, you're going to build up that sense of expertise and that attachment to your way of doing things. Unfortunately, that way of doing things probably is becoming obsolete faster than you want to admit. So how do we have a really flexible mindset that embraces change and drives on it? What do you think is the biggest reason? Now, you're, you've been doing this for years. I've been doing this too. I mean, if you're in the innovation space and you've had, you know, you've been able to build a few things that, in your life, You've had to practice unsafe thinking, right? Yeah. Tell me why, and it's and uh, it's an it's an it's a counterintuitive idea, but it's also kind of an obvious idea. Why mm -hmm. don't people do it? Uh, I mean, one of the things, like I said, is just that our brains are programmed to seek safety. Essentially, yeah. Uh, there's an interesting. I call it the safe thinking cycle. Yep, it's, yep. it's it's not entirely new, but it's important. Um, when we encounter threats. What happens, and you know, environment is constantly giving us threat because it's changing so quick. Our, our models are becoming obsolete. What happens is that we feel a sense of, of anxiety, right? And yeah. that anxiety actually leads the brain to shutting down all unnecessary um, cognitive and even physical. You, know, you stop digesting when a tiger is about to eat you, right? And yeah. you just you narrow your focus to what do I need to do to get out of this situation? What does that lead to? It leads to stereotypical thinking. Yep. You know, what can I do to allay this sense of anxiety and get out of it and get back to a sense of well-being? And stereotypical thinking, unfortunately, is just a recipe for more anxiety because you're not changing. Okay. Um, so what do you do about that? One of the simple things I talk about is how great innovators use anxiety as they, they see it. They tell themselves that it's fuel for creativity. Yep. If you're not feeling nervous and if you're not feeling like you're on the edge and taking a risk, you're actually not innovating. So how do you actually program yourself to do that? And and reframing, you know, cognitive reframing is a very well studied and important way of just, just telling yourself, hey, this is good, guys. This doesn't feel comfortable. And that's a good thing because if, if it did feel comfortable, we wouldn't be pushing the boundaries. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a hypocrite here. I'm going to talk about one of my big pet peeves, which is, okay. you know, I, I come from this field, which, I, you know, I, wor I was... Uh, I worked on some, I worked on, you know, AppleNet, which became iTunes and these other things. So I have a long history in this collaborative innovation space. But one of the things that's happened with social media, you're talking about dominant logic. It's what's called micro-segmenting. All the people that you listen to believe all the same baloney you believe. They listen to the same alt band, went to the same school, believe in the same yeah. religious sort of precepts that you believe. And if they don't, you unfriend them. The Spanish Inquisition couldn't have thought of this. So part of what you're talking about, my work too on the same thing about constructive conflict, is we have to encounter the other. We have to encounter yeah. the diversity of the world. So in a world of social media, this is my last big question for you. How yeah. do we do that when we're isolated with, with a dominant logic that just all it does is reinforce all the baloney we believe? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, there are studies, fascinating studies, where you know they'll take a, a difficult creative problem and will take a hand-picked group of experts and line them up and, and have them compete with a random group of non-experts. And the random group of non-experts will do better. And why is that? It's not because they know more. It's because there's more diversity. When when someone says, "I'm going to pick this guy, this guy, this," they're pulling from a, a very similar social network. And similar worldview, and you're going to get you know very similar thinking. So just you know schmoes off the street, beat the experts, and that's really important to think about. So that question you're talking about, first of all, I would just say, uh, don't draw most of your conclusions and information from social media. You know, like that's just not going to work. Certainly, get on friend people who are different than you. But even if you go out, and I, I talk about this in the book, even if you go out and start reading the other side, and you know following people you don't agree with. 
your brain is actually programmed to start using that to just reinforce your own beliefs. So look, I, and I'm going to read the other side. Aha, this is so stupid. When you sit down face to face with somebody and see their humanity and actually work with them to solve a problem that thinks differently than you or has different values than you do, you make enormous leaps and shifts. A lot of us fear that if we sit down with people who don't agree with us, we're somehow compromising our moral righteousness or something. Uh, that's, that's nothing to be further from the truth. We actually grow more effective in, in um, advocating for our ideas and more flexible in our thinking when we sit down and really talk to someone who sees the world differently. I'm going to send you to Washington to solve some problems. <laughs> I, that's what I'm in. Create some hybrid yeah. solutions. Now, you've got a new book coming out about unsafe thinking. Uh, it's got to be, it's chuck full. I've, I've seen some of the previews of it, of, of good advice. Where do we learn more about uh, you? Where do we learn more about how to connect with you? And where do we learn more about uh, what, you're, what you're working on now? Uh, so jonasacks.com is, uh, you know, got information about the new book, about the old book, about my speaking, um, some of the stuff I'm working on. I've been writing for Fast Company as well. So, um, yeah, that's the best best place. And in April, it hits the shelves. Um, so pre-orders are Fast and Furious and uh, <laughs> hopefully Fast and Furious. Uh, so, yeah, you can find me there. Jonah, thank you so much for being on Office Hours. I appreciate it. And I look forward to reading the new book. Thanks, Jeff. Great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.